Live with CDP, a weekly sports and entertainment podcast, live on YouTube, Facebook Live, Twitter, and on audio via Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, and Anchor FM. Now here's your host, Chris Pame. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Live with CDP Sports Talk on this Tuesday, November 1st, 2022, Season 4, Episode 45, Overall Episode 210. I'm looking forward to my uh, latest uh, um, podcast show today. And uh, as I do with all my shows, Live with CDP Sports Talk is brought to you by Barry Cohen Chevrolet Dealership, 905 Woodlawn Road West in the Guelph. Check out barrycollin.com and pre-owned GM vehicles, including the new all-electric Cadillac Lyric, uh, which is now pre-orders uh, are now available at barrycollin.com or give them a call at 519-824-0210. That's 519-824-0210. But check out the Cadillac Lyric, uh, the all-electric one, and as well as the all-electric Silverado. Both are now available for pre-orders at barrycollin.com or drop by there at 905 Woodlawn Road West in the Guelph Auto Mall and say hi to Nathan Lodd for me and uh, mention that CDP, Chris Pomey sent you to Barry Collin as well. Anyways, guys, I'm just waiting for my guests to come on today. I'm looking forward to my guest. Uh, today's guest is Dave Naylor. He's an NFL CFL insider for TSN, uh, delivering news and in-depth analysts uh, for the CFL and the NFL across all TSN platforms as well. So just bear with me, and hopefully Dave will be on in just a minute, and we'll talk some uh, CFL and also some NFL as well. I hope everyone's doing well on this uh, Tuesday, November 1st, and uh, just bear with me, guys. I'm just waiting for Dave to come on. Um, so anyways, uh, again, I want to say thank you to Dave for uh, giving me some time to come on and talk some NFL and CFL. And as we're waiting for Dave, I'm just going to show you guys a little video clip of the CFL Players of the Week as we wait for Dave to come on. Just bear with me, guys. It's a little special teams trickery, and it pays off with a first down as Bruno gets the reception. 22 yards. John Haggerty punching it away, getting blocked and recovered for an Alouette's touchdown. Jabari Ellis, welcome to the Alouette's roster and welcome to the end zone in week 21. Bobby. Hey guys, uh, just bear with me. Dave just popped on. So what we'll do is we'll show the, the remaining of the uh, video clip at the end of the podcast show. So bear with me, guys. I'm going to bring on Dave Naylor from uh, TSN, uh, NFL CFL Insider. Good morning, Dave. How are you doing? Not too badly. How are you doing? Good. Well, thank you so much for giving me some time this morning uh, to come on live with CDP. My pleasure. Always happy to talk football. I was going to say it's going to be a busy uh, month for you, especially with the uh, CFL playoffs starting this weekend and also the NFL, I guess, and uh, the trade deadline is today, I believe, at 4 o'clock. Yeah, trade deadline today. Um, I was at the Bills game Sunday night in uh, the Green Bay game. Uh, I was in uh, Athens, Ohio last week to see Curtis Rourke, pl uh, not play, but practice and sit down with him. I was in Champaign, Illinois the week before uh, with Chase and Sidney Brown. Um, I haven't had a day off in a while. And the only day I did, I went to a football game. So there you go. Went to the Argos in Montreal on Saturday. So lots and lots of football in my world. Yeah. Uh, hey, I was going to say, I, I read this on the internet this morning, and I think it's been confirmed. Uh, Bengals offensive analyst Adam Zimmer passed away at the age of 38. Wow. Wow. I was just reading that this morning. It's like, I'm I'm 50 years old. And I'm like, wow, 38's much too young. 
Well, it is. And, and look, it's a high stress job. Right. And I think that's I mean, 38 in any job, you don't expect something like that to happen. But uh, there is, I think, you know, a lot of recognition that the lifestyle that goes particularly with coaching in the National Football League, uh, you know, there's the, the, the pressure and the expectations that come with it. I, I always say, you know, I, this is something I say a lot. I said there, there's two types of people that are coaching in the CFL. Um, one, people who couldn't get an opportunity in the NFL. And I don't mean that just because they're not good enough to coach. I just mean they don't have the connections, the networks. Ne they're never going to get hired for an NFL staff just because they don't know the right people and things like that. But the other group are people that probably could coach in the NFL someday, but understand the grind and you know the year-round commitment that comes with that. And that in the CFL, not so much the CFL is different in season as much. It's off season. You actually get one. You know, there is there is downtime in the offseason. And and so I, I think there's a lot of people that enter the coaching and, and management professions that you know sometimes weigh the the pluses and minuses of making bigger dollars with a with a lot bigger commitment and pressure. And, and again, I don't can't speak to any of the details of this this recent passing, but I, I just think I know that that's something that people are aware of, that the lifestyle comes with some some drawbacks sometimes. Absolutely. Um I was going to say the NFL trade deadline is today at four o'clock. Dave, are you expecting any major trades or any little anything? Well, I, I, I usually say no when it comes to football, because football is not really a plug and play sport. You know what I mean? It's and but you look at what we've been seeing in the last little while. Um, it does seem that teams are treating the trade, the trade deadline you know, a little more like. Uh, they do in hockey, right, where you've got an expiring contract and you're not a playoff team. And it all has to do with draft capital. Right. I mean, there's no secret the best how the best teams in the National Football League get good. It's not free agency. It's not hitting on sixth round picks. Um, that can be sometimes hitting on sixth round pick. I mean, Tom Brady was a sixth round pick and there have been a few others. I mean, Bills were starting a sixth round pit rookie pick at, at corner this year for much of the season or are. Um, so. Not to be dismissive of those people, but it's about collecting draft capital, right? That's that's how teams and primarily, you know, top or middle of the draft. And I think teams are just practically looking at it and saying, you know, if we know we're not a playoff team or even if we have depth at this position. We're grooming somebody behind him for next season. We think this guy might be ready midway this season and therefore we're willing to make that move. Then you've got the finances and all that that sometimes comes into it as well. So. All those things are, are leading to a much busier NFL trade deadline. I, I mean, the team that I'm most closely around is, is the Buffalo Bills, of course. And there's been a lot of speculation about them and running back. And, you know, Alvin Kamara's name has been mentioned. Uh, I think it's been reported that they, they made an inquiry there. Uh, I think it's been it, it reported that they at least had a conversation when it came to Christian McCaffrey. Uh, it's an interesting one because, you know, the Bills have – three running backs, right? And Devin Singletary is a really, I think, highly respected player on that team, but he's not a high-end NFL back. Like, he will you know, he had 66 yards the other night and 50 of them in the first half when they were really laying it down against Green Bay. You know, Zach Moss, one of their other backs, they've been sitting out, at least is a healthy scratch in one recent game, and then they drafted a player, James Cook, in the second round, who really, I think James Cook was the guy that they thought if he – kind of got up to speed fast enough they wouldn't need to make a move for a running back at, at any point this season but it's been a slower runway for him he had a nice play the other day probably his best play as a, as a buffalo bill in that game sunday night i think i believe it was in the second quarter <coughs> uh, so but they uh, they're certainly a team that you know if, if they could swing uh, you know they were linked to saquon barkley earlier as well right but that was before the giants went six and one so you know when you look at players uh, like a Camaro, you could certainly see how a guy like that who can really do damage, like a tackle breaker, you know, a guy who can get into, can break tackles and get in open space. Uh, but at the same time, I, I don't think the Bills are in a very desperate position when it comes to, you know, their offense overall. Now, I'm an Eagles fan. Um, I, I'm happy with getting Robert Quinn, but I would like to see us get maybe another running back. I like Miles Sanders, but he's sort of similar to Singletary. And I like Boston Scott as well, but I really would like to see the Eagles. Hopefully they can pick up somebody. They do have flexibility, I think, with the cap and with all those extra draft picks they have as well. It's always a bit of a mix, and I, and I think this pertains to Philadelphia, certainly, given the way their season has gone so far. Uh, and, and it would also to Buffalo, right, is that even if you can identify a need on your team, there's always that risk of messing with 
chemistry, right? And I don't mean yes. just chemistry in the locker room. I just mean guys, you know, who play in certain circumstances or with certain players around them, and they're being and your team's having success. You know, do you want to mess with that? And I think it's true in every sport. I think that maybe the, the chemistry of 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 those kind of things is maybe a little more fine in football than it is in some sports. So I think that's the other thing. I mean, you know, when you talk with the Eagles, well, they got to make a move. Well, really? <laughs> like, have you watched them play? You know, and I mean, it's the same thing kind of with the, with the Bills, right? And and I think, you know, the, the in the Bills case, it was a little more because they they're so pass heavy, right? And the, and there's still questions about if they got into a game where they really had to kind of grind it out. You know, can they do that, right? Um, and and the Eagles, I mean, I think the biggest thing there. I remember the start of the year, the big topic. I I used to I memorize figures a lot of times, but that. Man, I have them in my head for six weeks and then I don't. But I forget what uh, Jalen Hurts' completion percentage was last season. Uh, and but that was a real concern, right? Is is can can he up that number uh, and and be a high a much more efficient passer? And, and and if he could, he certainly had the tools to be that dual threat quarterback that that you know kind of can can excel in the NFL these days. So um, you know, it's uh, I, I was around their camp this summer for a day, and it was. Uh, certainly a lot of optimism. It's funny because I remember the last time the Eagles had the dream team. I was down yes. there camp that year as well. 2011. Yeah. Yeah. See, but that was, you know, that, that was less of a team. Like I would say this Eagle team has kind of, you know, grown up together and they've added pieces. That was really a true sort of like New York Yankee style free agent team. Right. Yes. And I just don't think that works in football. Absolutely agree. And uh, I've been a, a Hertz backer since day one. And uh, I have had some Bills fans give me a hard time about comparing him to Allen. But to me, he's progressed in a third year, just like Josh Allen did. Josh Allen didn't come out and dominate his first two years in the league. It it took him to about a third year, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I think he, he was refined, right? I think what we've seen in, in Josh Allen's case was a very raw physical specimen that people didn't know whether he would be able to be refined into, you know, a guy who could throw the ball with the precision and timing and, and make the judgments that you need to be successful in the national football league as a quarterback. The, the upside, you know, for, for the bills on the risk, on the risk reward of Josh Allen is that if you could refine him, you know, if you could develop him, you're, you're going to have a freak, a freak physical specimen, right? Like I would say him and Lamar Jackson are the two, freakish specimens playing quarterback in the national football league right now, because they're just so big and strong and fast and they can throw the ball, you know, tremendously as well. I wouldn't put Hertz in that category as the, as the physical freak. When I talk about him as a dual, yes. front, like he's mobile, he can take yes. off he's run, but, but there's, I mean, it hurts to tackle Josh Allen or, That's or true. Lamar Jackson. Like, you know, like, like there, there, and even you can see the way sometimes guys have to tackle those guys because they're going to get hurt if they don't tackle him a certain way, right? Um, when 6'5", 250 at full speed comes down the field at you, and yep. as to his, sometimes to the you know to the concern of Bills fans, um, you know, not afraid to take hits. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, look, I, I think I think, but I think your point about the development of quarterbacks is true. I think we've had a few quarterbacks in recent years who kind of looked like they've got it out of the gate, and then that becomes sort of the standard. Where I mean, let's use Peyton Manning as the standard, right? I think he was three and thirteen his first year, you know, awesome. as a starting quarterback, right? And yeah. I don't have his touchdown interception ratio in front of me, but it probably wasn't very good. And no, yeah, you know, I, I think as quarterbacks have come out of college, maybe well, two things have happened. You know, I think there's a lot of deeper development of quarterbacks with personal training and quarterback coaches and all that kind of stuff. Then you've also got less of a difference going from college offenses to pro offenses, right? 30 years ago, college football was just a power running game. And, you know, quarterbacks kind of had to develop that more at the NFL level. Now they come out of college, throwing the ball, spread offenses, all that kind of stuff. So there's less of a leap. I'm not saying from this, the talent gap has changed, but the style of game is not as differentiated as it was you know, 20, 30 years ago. So, you know, when, when you do see a guy come out and whether it's a Justin Herbert, um, you know, or even Robert Griffin III in his first year before he got injuries, and you see these guys kind of like, out of the gate in year number one. Um, but I, I, I think to your point, patience, I mean, there's, you can practice all you want. I think, you know, I, I, I think quarterbacks can stay very sharp once they've developed without playing, as we've seen sometimes they dip barely play in the preseason and they're great in week number one, but the only way to get to that level is to play, you know, and that's, that's, I think what we've seen, you know, Hurst got the opportunity to Allen has, and, 
and you know many others it's the question is you know how long they're going to give you and sometimes uh <laughs> that that could be out of your control absolutely now i was going to say you're at the bills packers game sunday night mm -hmm. any concerns if you're a buffalo bills fan obviously they they won the game handily handily but they didn't really put the gas down on the pedal on the, in the second half and Allen did make a couple bad decisions and the run defense gave up what over 200 yards to the Packers yeah well I'll speak to both those things first in the second half that was undoubtedly their worst half of football it was Josh Allen's worst half of football you know two interceptions especially the second one he threw when they were down in the red zone I mean they're up 27 10 just you know, don't turn it over, kick a field goal, go up by 20 and play defense. You're, you're going to be in. Instead, they, you know, kind of let Green Bay back into the game a little bit with that. And his earlier interception wasn't very good either. But particularly one at the end of the game, situationally, was one he should have just chucked out of bounds at the back of the end zone. Uh, you had Jordan Poyer takes an unsportsmanlike penalty, which again, you know, game was not in doubt. Um, I'm sorry, Gabe Davis did, excuse me. Gabe Davis took an unsportsmanlike penalty. Uh, Jordan Poyer went out of the game. That's I mean, that's part of the second answer here. Um, so, look, I, I thought in the, in the second half, the Bills looked like a team that had been reading their clippings for the first six weeks. Now, all that said, that's the only time they've looked like that this year. And, you know, I think there are times in the season where even though you only play once a week in football, teams lose focus. And I, I said this on, on SportsCenter the other night that I think there's going to be a lot of teaching by Sean McDermott off that half of football, <laughs> right? Because they got away with it. Because they were up big against a team that's, you know, undermanned and was a big underdog. But they can't do those kind of things. And that's I think that's the kind of thing you teach off those things. And say, hey, guys, we got away with it. But don't mistake that with being okay. And, yeah, Josh Allen was not – even it was interesting listening to kind of his self-evaluation after the game. He was pretty hard on himself for a game that they won by 10 points. Now, as for the run game, I thought the strategy in this game was really interesting. Because Green Bay, you think of as traditionally a passing team because of Aaron Rodgers. But they didn't have Alan Lazard. Christian Watson went out of the game. I mean, they had Romeo Dubs, who's a or Dobbs, excuse me, who's a, a rookie. And they have Sammy Watkins, who was the Bills' number one pick, like 2014. I mean, that was essentially they don't throw to their tight ends very much. They didn't. They didn't have a lot of weapons. And yet, the Bills seem to still rather defend the run than defend than give give Aaron Rodgers a chance to throw the ball. And so, you know. If you look at the way they defended that, the Bills' base defense is a, is a nickel defense where they always play an extra slot corner, right, Taron Johnson. And even when Green Bay was just lining up and running it and running it and running it and running it, they never, you know, they never slotted, they never they never got out of that nickel defense to, to stuff the box. They just said, okay, you want to run it all day. We'll And again, Buffalo entered the game as the number one run defense in the league, averaging like 68 yards a game. Well, they gave up 200. But it was almost like they made a choice saying, we think no matter how much the Green Bay Packers run the ball, our run defense is good enough while we're in nickel defense that they can't beat us. And if we get up, that'll really be the case because it's going to kill clock, which it did. Um, they never really came out of that. And so they were, even without the weapons, they were more afraid of Aaron Rodgers' arm, I think, than they were the 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 which is a formidable run game that Green Bay has, but I just think the, the probably philosophically the Bills are looking and going, okay, if we're running and throwing it, and primarily throwing it, and they're running it and throwing it a little bit, in a in a you know exchange for exchange game, we're gonna win, and they did, you know, and that did it was just so strange because there was just no urgency to the to the Packers game. They were so they stayed committed to the run, and and I guess Buffalo was thinking like. You know, we're, we're happy to let you keep doing this because even if you're chunking off four, six yards at a time, because we're up in this game and because we generally don't give up big plays on, on, on our run defense, uh, you know, those athletic linebackers that they have, uh, it was, I just thought it was interesting. It was, it was a bit of a weird game that way. If, if I, if I said to you, you know, a year ago, Josh Allen, healthy Josh Allen for the bills, healthy Aaron Rodgers for the Packers, how many yards do you think they throw for? <laughs> I think, well, I don't Oops, I think he froze up. Just bear with us, guys. I think Dave just froze up. Star Wars. Oh, got you there. We're back. Good. Yeah, it happens sometimes with technology. Um, no I was going to now with the Green Bay Packers. Do you think this team? Obviously, they're not going to win the division, but do you think the Packers showed you something in this game, and that they can maybe get themselves into a wild card spot in the NFC? Yeah, I mean, look, they. 
you know, that Buffalo's defensive line is, is very good. Uh, and they, you know, for, a, for an offensive line that's pretty banged up, um, they protected Aaron Rodgers pretty well. So, I mean, that, that bodes well. The biggest, I mean, they, they got a decent run game. The, the offensive line, given who they were lined up against, I think played not, de- not badly. The question is going to be, you know, are they going to get Lazard back? Um, you know, Randall Cobb's out. Um, you know, can Romeo, look, Romeo Dobbs made a catch in the, in the end zone the other night that, you know, anybody in the National Football League would be proud of. Um, you know, so I, it's really going to be, can Aaron Rodgers' ability to throw the ball make up for their lack of talent at receiver? And it just seems so counterintuitive that they don't have better talent at receiver and that they let Devontae Adams go. But I mean, this is still a very, very good secondary. I mean, they, that was the number one pass defense in the league the Bills were throwing against the other night. Um, so, you know, they, they defend the pass very well. Their run defense has been an issue, although that got better over the course of the game. See, teams have gashed Green Bay a lot in the last you know, three, four weeks. And when Buffalo came out and just kind of ran the ball with Singletary at will, it's like, oh my goodness, this defense is just, this is, this is the run defense that we've seen in the stats the last few weeks. But they shored that up. So yeah, I, I think, look, here's what I'm something else about Buffalo. And I'm not trying to just pump up the bills here, but they destroyed Tennessee, right? Tennessee's won what, five in a row? Yeah, uh, so, I believe so. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, they, they Buffalo's had a really tough schedule. First of all, you know, they're playing the Ravens, playing my, my, Miami and the Ravens on the road, opening against the Super Bowl champions and um, op- opening against the Super Bowl champions. And I mean, they had, you know, cream puff game against Pittsburgh, which they, you know, they basically waved the white flag halfway through the third quarter. Um, and then they pounded, pounded Tennessee. So my point is that a 10 point loss to the Bills is, is not an embarrassment, you know, at, at this stage of things. Definitely. Now I was going to, I wanted to ask you right now, who are the best teams in the NFC? Uh, bet, basically, I, I, sorry, I'm still fight, fighting a cold. Uh, who are the two best teams in the NFL right now? The two best teams in the NFL right now are probably <clears throat> Buffalo and Kansas City. I would probably go there. And and if you look at, you know, what happened when they played, you know, it's a four-point game, right? Um I would I would probably go to those two teams right now and, and say and, and I know I'm dissing Philadelphia and part of it honestly and this is you'll understand the reality of it is and this is one of the differences in the CFL and the NFL is in the CFL of the course bear with me guys I think Dave just froze up just bear with me. It happens occasionally on the uh, we'll podcast. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. Oh, I think you're back. It just, okay, I'm gonna, I'm... yeah, no worries, Dave. No worries. Are you still, just let me know if you're okay for time still. Yeah, I'm going to move. I'm going to move spots here in a second. Just one second. Okay. okay. No problem. No worries. And like I said, with the Eagles, I did not expect them to start seven and all this year. And uh, Nick Serrani, I thought, I think has done a great job in his two years now in Philadelphia, uh, 16 and eight. And uh, I'm, I'm taking the attitude like the players and the coaches do is uh, one game and one week at a time and not to look too far ahead. I'm, as you, move, I'm moving here. I'm changing yeah. locations on you. Okay. No worries, Dave. But I was going to say uh, the Eagles have a short week this week against uh, the Houston Texans, and I'm worried that could be a trap game because uh, when you're 7-0, and guys can say hey to the coaching staff, ah, we're, we're winning, we, we can, you can get into lazy habits and stuff like that when you get into a long winning streak. And I'm just worried that they might overlook the Texans on Thursday night. Yeah, well, on Thursday nights tend to be – I think you've got a couple of things there. You've got the potential of a trap game, and then I, I think we get – uh, sometimes atypical performances out of Thursday night. I, I mean, football players are, there's going to be a lot of debate about, the, you know, the safety of, of Thursday night. And, and I think when people look at the quality of the games, they wonder if the players have had enough recovery time and things. And, and I think those are all fair questions. I think there's also an element of it where, you know, football players are just such creatures of routine. I mean, their whole lives are built on routine. And so, you know, when you come back with three days off and play a game on a Thursday night, it's it's just not what they've done all their lives. You know, it's just a different different kind of thing. And and so, I think it just throws another variable. When you, you know, if you're a 
if you're the Houston Texans in that situation, you want as many variables thrown into that game as possible, right? As many things that are that can make it in a typical outcome or an unpredictable outcome. And Thursday night, I think, just kind of goes into that. It has last night felt like Thursday night for a while till halftime. And not, I mean, not a very compelling game overall, anyway. But uh, you know, the the offenses were really struggling the first half, and I, I had to ask myself, is it is it Thursday or Monday? That's that seems to be the <laughs> absolutely way. the Bengals now are four and four. Do you think they're still a contender in the AFC? Or do oh, you think really it's amazing how much difference one player makes? I mean, it was funny. I I felt like after watching Joe Burrow struggle as much as he did in that game, uh, I wanted to go back and you know watch the national championship game at LSU and remind me what he, myself what he can look like when he looks unstoppable, right? I mean, if I was to bookend, you know. The, the, what Joe Burrow looks like in my mind in one extreme and the other, I would have go with last night and the, and the college football championship game we use at LSU. Uh, but I, I know that's, I, I think it's always concerning for a team that when they don't have their number one receiver, that so much of the field closes up and they couldn't run the ball either. Like it's one, again, on television, it's hard to tell what, what defense the other team is playing, but you know, if you've got a situation where that you, you're really struggling to throw the football, uh, you figure that that's because they're devoting extra coverage to that area of the field. And so you should be able to run it. But I mean, their runs, I mean, Joe Mixon was struggling getting back to the line of scrimmage half the time. So uh, it, it, they're, they're real. That's a, it's a real curious team because of the way obviously last season ended. And then you, you know, you come out this year and they just don't look like the same team. And then just when they're starting to get traction, you know, they lay that one out last night. So uh, the Bengals are a bit of a mystery to me. I gotta be honest. I think the Ravens still win that division. Yeah, I, I would expect so. I, I I would think there's a good chance of that. Absolutely. And I was going to say, there's going to be a number of teams fighting for that wild card spot right now. The Bengals four and four. New England. Do you think New England is a playoff contender? Yes, because I think they're you know they 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 they're not the New England Patriots that are going to you know be favorites every week. Um, but in with the playoff pool being slightly expanded. <clears throat> Uh, with you know the Patriots being competitive, I mean, how many games have they not been competitive in this season? Not very many, you know. And if you look at, uh, if you give me a, a New England team that can be competitive week to week, I think through you know his expertise in coaching situational football, that opens the door for Bill Belichick, you know, to win a couple of games maybe that another coach wouldn't. Um, you know, I think you put him in close games, uh, he will find ways you know, for his team to win them. And I, and if that's one thing the Patriots have proven this year is that they can play, they, they, they can be competitive. You know, and that's, that's something I don't know that we were hundred percent certain of at the start of the season. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine sort of a completely uncompetitive new England team, but it's just, it's been sort of, you know, it, in the, this is a different era of, of the Patriots, right? Because of still the uncertainty at the most important position in the field. And um, you know, some of the other players they have that are, I would say substantially unproven. Uh, just quick thoughts on the Jets and the Giants starts right now. And then I just wanted to get into some CFL questions with you, Dave. Well, it's funny, you know, I was at the Giants camp this summer and, <clears throat> you know, it, they are kind of the Buffalo Bills, right? Of the, of the, uh, of, you know, 2.0, right? With, uh, uh, you know, their GM, Joe Shane, who came from Miami, but also was in Buffalo. Um, and then you've got, um, you've got, uh, you know, Brian Dable, of course, you know, coming from Buffalo, uh, you know, you can make the argument that uh, the, the Giants could be Canada's team, their assistant GM and their director of uh, pro scouting, I believe is his title, are both guys from Toronto. So, you know, to recognize the, the Giants uh, Canadian contingent there. Um, but but I mean, there was a sense of like having nothing to lose. Right. Because when you take over a team like that and you've got players under contract like Saquon Barkley and like Daniel Jones that are you know high end players high draft picks, guys that are going to come up for contract renewal very soon. You know, you kind of say, you kind of go with it and say, okay, if this doesn't work this season, then, you know, the direction we go becomes really obvious because we can tear it right down, starting with those guys. No one's going to criticize us. We didn't draft them. Um, you know, we'll get the opportunity to do it our own way. And we and if we go with them and and they play well, well, then we got a good problem, you know, and that's kind of what, what the, what's happened with the Giants. But I – I, I think that's that was one. I just want to say with the Jets, I don't think anybody saw that coming. Well, I shouldn't say anybody. I think that's a real surprise 
that that this just felt like a year that you know they were going to I don't want to say tank, but the expectations were not going to be such that they were going to be competitive for the division. So, um, and and the Jets um, again, just weirdly through my own surfing and watching, I have not watched the Jets game yet this year. So it's hard for me to evaluate them. And it's, it's funny, you get to about, what are we, six, seven weeks in the season, you feel like, okay, I've seen at least, you know, half of football from everybody, but I don't believe the Jets have been on prime time yet. Uh, and when I've been up against them, I've always been watching other teams. So I'm going to pass on my evaluation of the Jets because I have, I have not watched them this season. And I think they're taking on the Bills this Sunday from uh, MetLife Stadium. Yeah, they are. And I mean, and I know coming off last week, everyone was talking about Zach Wilson and the, the three picks, right? And that's, yeah, I think when you, match that up against the pressure that the bills can get and the skill in their secondary. And you see a rookie quarterback who threw three picks last week. You know, I don't necessarily have to watch them to know that that's a dangerous matchup for them. Any chance the bills could, this could be a trap game for the bills too. I, I don't think so. And I, and I think go back to a little earlier, what we talked about is that um, the fact that that game went kind of sour in the second half Sunday night and they still won it that may be your kind of defense against uh, the trap game, right? Let's say they, they beat green Bay, you know, 41, 14, right. And, and then maybe the trap game possibility opens up a little more. The fact that that game went, I mean, people always say it's always easy to coach after you play poorly. You know, it's always easy to coach after a loss because not because it's a loss necessarily, but because it means you played poorly usually. And uh, again, I think that, that trap game may have been instead a trap half you know? and and because they had a big enough lead and we're against a team that was really undermanned when it came to throwing the football, they got away with it. But I think they may end up getting the same benefit of, you know, of what you get out of a trap game. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what you said that that trap half of football might be the best thing to happen to the bills and sure. and, and Sean McDermott, former Eagles uh, coach as well for 12 years. Uh, I think he's done a great job in Buffalo and turning around that culture of losing into being winners. Yep. Okay. No question. Uh, now that's a big part of it. Absolutely. And uh, I was going to say with Nick Serrani, I was one of the critics and, and it's like, what are they doing hiring Nick Serrani? But Nick Serrani so far in two seasons has done a really good job with the Eagles and the guys seem to like playing for him as well. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, hiring the right people. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, Sean McDermott, who I think is, I think his winning percentage is now higher than Marv Levy's. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it really, it really is. Football is a business where, you know, the ability to hire well, is <laughs> is paramount and then the and then also the other part of it is knowing how much patience you know you, i i think there are football coaches that get fired all the time that just don't have the opportunity to see through their vision of things or live through the things that they don't control um and you know that that's you don't get a lot of time in in today's game but i i do think that that, that that's the most important determinant of success or failure i mean uh, and same thing when you hire your GM, right? I mean, because your GM and your GM is essentially got to be a good hire and, and his, his vehicle to hire is the draft. It's all about hiring, you know, scheme is great, you know, and fans can exit those to, to, to the cows come home. But I, I think that's secondary over, you know, hiring the right coaches and, and the GMs, you know, finding the right players. Absolutely. Now I just wanted to get into the CFL questions too, sure. Dave. I know you got to get going at 1130, but yep. um, CFL, huge CFL fan as well. Grew up in the CFL in the late seventies, like the NFL. I'm mm -hmm. one of the few people that like old football and it just seems like this generation, it's either NFL or that's it. And I don't know, understand why fans can't like both leagues. Well, I, I think that's, you know, that's the key. Right. And, and I think it's, you know, it skews in different parts of the country, but the point is that I don't think we need to tell people that, you know, CFL players are all just as good as NFL players in order for you to like the NFL, like the CFL game. I mean, as a, as a kid, I just tell you from my perspective, as a kid, I love the CFL. I love the NFL, but I, but I, I wasn't under the illusion that CFL players were, you know, on a par with NFL players. That, that wasn't part of what sold me on the game. I didn't need to believe that. Because it's not true, first of all, for the most part. So it's a good thing I didn't need to believe it. But it didn't matter is the point I'm making. You know, and, and I think you look at it something like the, the best model you could probably use for what Canadian fans could be, should be, is college football. You look at the U.S. Is college football as good as the NFL? No. 
Do only a handful of college football players off even the best teams make the NFL? Yes, that's that's pretty true. Uh, and and there's a lot of really good teams that don't produce any players, you know, for the NFL. But people like college football in America because it's its own thing. College football. They're not always holding it up and measuring it to the National Football League. Uh, in fact, they never do that. I mean, it's not even treated like a development tier. It's treated as its own, you know, star system. It has its own star system. It is its own powerful entity. That would be the model that I would love to see, you know, Canadians adopt for following. Because, you know, like college football in, in, in Canada, American college football is a niche for most people, right? Maybe you follow Michigan. Because we don't have schools involved, because there's so many schools, unless you've got some affiliation or love for one particular school, it's a hard sport to follow en masse from Canada. Um but I, I think that if you had that idea with the CFL, the people, and that that really, I think, was where we came from. I guess you say you and I are of the age that we remember that. It was, you know, I, I understood that that guys were getting paid more in the NFL, so the best players are going to go there. Um, but that still leaves a lot of really great players in Canada, and it leaves a different game for us to enjoy as well. So that's always been my take. You know, people always, I always, I get this question kind of quite a bit. You know, like, especially like if it's not on camera, someone sees me somewhere, asks me somewhere, and they'll go, hey, in, in really, what, what do you like better? Like CFL or NFL? Like, really, what do you like? And I'll always say, I like good matchups. You know, you give me BC, Calgary, you know, or, you know, the Texans in Jacksonville, I'm going to watch BC, Calgary, right? You give me, you know, Saskatchewan, Ottawa, or Buffalo in Kansas City, I'm going to watch... Buffalo and Buffalo, Kansas, Kansas City. City. And, that, and that, that really is. I, I'm a fan of matchups. The advantage the National Football League has is they play 16 games a week, right? So out of those 16 games, you're going to get four that are absolute dynamite matchups, right? You could blast all over national TV. You're going to get four that are total dogs that they can bury on regional TV. And then in between, you know, you get games, good matchups, okay matchups that pop up all over. In, in, in the CFL, kind of the best and worst thing about the CFL as a television property is every single game is on national TV. Now, that's great sometimes, but sometimes there's some games maybe at the end of the year. You don't necessarily want splashed across three hours of national television, but you can't predict what those games are going to be. And, the, and I just think it, it leads to the perception sometimes that people will turn on a late season CFL game and see, man, it's a dog. Yeah, well, in the NFL, that game gets buried on regional TV, right? Because because they don't, they, so there, there are some natural sort of, presentation advantages or programming advantages of the NFL is just because of its number of teams. But um, yeah, I, I think that the real problem is, is that young people today, through my experience, at least in this part of the country, do not see the football world as sort of two separate entities equally, you know, worthy of our attention and love the way they did when you and I were kids. And I've been outspoken on this. I think the league knows this. I don't think anybody's in denial about it. The generational thing is the biggest challenge the Canadian Football League faces. And uh, my nephew, who's going to the East Final with me, he's never been to a CFL game. The first thing he asked me was, he's 25 years old, can I bet on the game? Because I guess kids his age like to bet on the NFL games. And I said, yes, you can. And I said, you can get beer at the game. And I said, BMO Field's a great facility. So I'm hoping when he goes to this East Final with me, he gets to see a great game. And then he'll learn that he can like the CFL as well as the NFL. It, it's it's hard when you haven't got them by 25. Yes. I, I have seen conversions. I have seen, you know, uh, you know mature conversions, shall we say it. Uh, but yeah, I, maybe maybe it's a spark that happens. And, it, you know, every it's funny because every time I meet somebody who's 25 or 30 or younger and they're really, you know, literate on the CFL, I'll always ask them, how many of your friends watch this? How many? And, and unfortunately, I hate to say this, the answers I traditionally get are not very many. You know, and again, I'm I'm speaking in Southern Ontario. I live kind of in you know, Mississauga, so I'm I, I know I have lived in other parts of the country. I lived in Ottawa for 16 years. I lived in Saskatchewan for two years. I know what it's like out there. Uh, I know it's different in Ottawa, even. And and at, like to be honest, it's different in Hamilton, 40 minutes from where I'm sitting. You know, so it's that's that's just you know the way it is. I was going to ask you, what are your overall thoughts on this 2022 CFL season and which teams have surprised you so far this year and maybe a disappointing team or two? I didn't think BC was going to be as good as they are. I didn't think Nathan Rourke was going to be as good as he is. I thought that was 
a really risky thing. I, I mean, I just, to be honest, it wasn't like I didn't believe in Nathan Rourke. I just thought he would go through the typical up and downs, ups and downs that quarterbacks in this league face in their second year in the league when they haven't started very many games. I mean, I wasn't, that wasn't dismissing him. I, I certainly, uh, you know, recognize Nathan Rourke's talents, but I, I did not see what happened coming like that. That was that I was as surprised as anybody. Um, you know, I had a chance to talk to Rick Campbell early in the season at length about all the things that went into his decision to make Nathan Rourke the starter. And at the end of that conversation, I really had a much broader understanding of, of why they had had the courage and their convictions to do that. So the BC Lions would be the team that surprised me the most. Not surprised that Winnipeg's still good. Not surprised with what Calgary's done this year. Um, you know, I guess I guess I wouldn't say Ottawa's surprised because I think we all knew when they lost Jeremiah Mazzoli. And the losses started to pile up, and you know, I still don't think it's a bad football team. You know, and I, and I hope they don't blow it up. I think I think there's a lot of potential still with that team. Uh, and you know, you don't play close, fourteen out of eighteen or whatever they did, you know, and be a garbage team. Wins and losses are what matter. But if this was year one of a rebuild instead of year whatever three or four, uh, there'd probably be a lot more satisfaction with what they did this year. You know, if you put it in that kind of context. But yeah, unquestionately, it's Saskatchewan. You know, like the team was what four and one. And, you know, things just went sideways and they, you know, they, they couldn't run the ball. They couldn't, Cody Fajardo looked like he didn't trust his offensive line because he would drop back, set his feet and then take off like immediately. It would seem most times he just, he didn't believe that if he stood there and looked downfield, he, that he wasn't going to get killed. And the sack stats would tell you he had reason to worry about that. Um, you know, defensively, I think they, you know, they were okay, but um, they, you know, they, they, they weren't, I don't know. They just weren't a dynamic team this year. And and I think a lot of the thing about them is they, other than, you know, a few games, they didn't really get blown out. Right. So it wasn't like they were the bottom dropped out of that team. They were just good enough to be beat every week. Um, and I'm not sure Cody Fajardo was the problem necessarily. Again, when you, when you take away, you know, when the run game falters as much as it did in the second half of the season and the offensive line is giving that kind of protection, that's, that's a double win, right? Quarterbacks like to have both, <laughs> you know, protection and a run game. Uh, I would say for most of the second half of the season, Cody Fajardo didn't seem to have either. So, yeah, I would say they were the most disappointing team uh, of the season, no question. Craig Dickinson come back, or do you think they're going to fire him and bring in a new coaching staff? I I think the changes in Saskatchewan could be minimal. And I think a lot of it has to do with this coach's cap, right, that, that people see what Edmonton went through. You know, blasting coaches and GMs with time left on their deals. And you have to amortize that over five years. It really inhibits uh, who you can hire, how many coaches you can hire. And the fans hate this. Um, and I understand why. I, I, I don't hate it. I, I do think that teams need to be more accountable for the coaches that they hire. I, do, I think the idea of, you know, hiring somebody and then wanting to fire them a year later. I, I know there's extreme circumstances, but I do think this, I think this league treats coaches, the teams in this league te- treats coaches as too disto- disposable. And this puts the brakes on that. Um, you know, and it also a lot, you know, keeps teams from spending themselves overspending on, on coaches or spending on multiple coaches, you know, paying two or three coaches at the same time, all these things we've seen. And, and I understand why the fans don't like it because when they want to fire somebody, they don't want any restrictions and fans are usually by the way, a lot quicker to want to fire people than, you know, GMs and team presidents are. Uh, so look, overall, I, I, if it makes teams a little more accountable for the coaches that they hire, so be it, you know, and, and if it protects teams economically, uh, so be it. So I, you know, I don't, I, I'm also a guy who doesn't believe, like I understand players sometimes, like when a player has a good year, maybe the next year is a bad year. And you look at that guy's age and you look at his body and you look at maybe he's lost a step. He's never going to be that guy again. Right. We know that. Happened. Like I'll use Brandon Banks as an example in Toronto. Right. A serviceable player for the Argos this year, but he wasn't the Brandon Banks of three years ago. And he's never going to be that Brandon Banks again because he's subject to something that we're all subject to. And that's age. OK. But coaching, when a coach has a bad year or his team has a bad year, doesn't mean that that guy's never going to be. Uh, you know, have coach a good team again, or he's not going to make better decisions. And I guess that's the part I'm making. Right? Craig Dick- Dickinson was regarded as a, as a pretty good head coach in the CFL. Now, has he made some moves this year that I question? Yeah. Um, but that's going to happen when you have a lousy season, and you miss the playoffs. I- is he unsuitable to be a head coach in the Canadian football league? I would say no, <laughs> you know, and could he be 
all of a sudden very successful next season? Absolutely he could. So that's kind of the difference, right? I understand why you got to move on from players when their performance goes down. But I think sometimes we just believe that if a coach has one bad year or his team has one bad Get year. Like, I, and I think part of what comes to this also is that in the CFL where the gate matters so much, right? It's a gate-driven league still, even in this age of television. And the season ticket bases are not selling at the stadiums before the year. I mean, in the NFL, you know, the Cincinnati Bengals can bring back Marvin Lewis year after year after year after year after year. It doesn't matter what the fans think. Right? Fans don't want him. Too bad. Stadium's full every week. We don't have to put our ear to the ground and make our coaching decision because we're afraid of the fans. They're there no matter what. In the CFL, I think there's a fear that you cannot have an unpopular coach because if you have an unpopular coach, the fans will show up, you know, we'll, and, and, and we'll see what happens. I, I'm not in Saskatchewan. I couldn't, I wouldn't necessarily define Craig Dickinson as an unpopular coach. I would say he's done some unpopular things maybe this year. Um, and, you know, I, I think the whole kind of the, the quarterback change and the timing of that, I think was the one that probably drew the most criticism. Um, there have been other things I, I, over the course of the year, but, but I mean, again, that's going to happen in a losing season. So I don't know necessarily that he's an unpopular coach, but, you know, he's probably at the low ebb of his popularity. We could say that. And so if the riders decide to retain him, and here's another thing I don't, I don't never buy is this idea that, well, you can't get the guy into his last year of his deal because then he's a lame duck. So you got to add, really? Like, show me the evidence for that. I, I mean, I, you know, who's you know, who's a lame duck coach this year, Mike O'Shea. How's that going? You know, Pretty good. I think Pretty he was good. a lame duck coach the last, I, I just, I've never, when I've looked at this, even in other sports, there doesn't seem to be a correlation where if you're in the last year of your contract, it undermines your ability to coach. I'm sure like agents and coaches tell teams that because I'd like to have an extra year of my deal. So they fire me. I've got an extra year of, of insurance as well, but I, I don't necessarily buy that. So if Saskatchewan goes to Craig Dickinson and I believe Jeremy O'Day has got a year left as well and say, we're going to retain you, but not extend you. And I apologize. if I've got the contract years wrong. Cause I'm, I'm not, I haven't referenced that. But if they go to you and say, we're going to retain you, but not extend you. Now, I don't think that's a condemnation. I don't think that's necessarily unfair. And I, and I don't think it, I think a lot of times that is the option that makes sense. And if I was looking at the Saskatchewan referees right now, I would say that's the option that makes sense. I get why you don't want to add another year to his contract. They had a bad year. Got to prove something to you. Okay. Next year. He's already got a contract for next year. Perfect. Come back. Prove us, prove to us next season that you deserve another contract. We have a good year. You'll get one. We have a bad year. You're not going to be retained. Oh, and that means the team won't have to eat a bunch of money, which, you know, it's kind it's of business too, right? That's part of yeah, it. Absolutely. I was going to say, and uh, with Ottawa, I'm hoping they give Bob Dice the interim uh, at least another year to see how he can get that team turned around. Because I, I, I agree. They're not as bad as that record is. No, and I think, I think the biggest thing Bob Dice has going against him is that he's part of the existing staff, which was not very popular, right, because of the record. Um, the fact that they played, I mean, they, you know, they, they played well and they had some close games. Unfortunately, that's going to remind people of the old staff <laughs> as well. Um, and, and look, and, and I, look, I, I thought they, you know, came out and the fact they won under him and, and played competitively and, and people who were around the team tell me that the players responded very positively to Bob Dice. And I know when I talked to their GM, Sean Burke, on the day that Paul Lapolis was fired, he assured me without me asking that Bob Dice was going to be a candidate for that head coaching position. So uh, everybody who knows Bob has interacted with Bob, worked with Bob, anything. I will still wait for the first negative thing I've ever heard anybody say about him. So he's very, he's held in you know very high esteem by players and fellow coaches. I uh, seem to have you know the belief of the players this year. They were competitive, uh, but they got to get this one right. It's back to our early conversation, right? It's, a, it's the most important thing. In, in, in football and maybe any sport is just you got to hire the right people and you know i think sean burke who's you know a very calculated guy when it came to you know what his future was going to be he, he you know guy who started in kind of community relations right and and set his sights on becoming a gm and and did so and i bet he's had a lot of time to think about what kind of coach he'd want to have with him as a gm i mean i'm sure he's been thinking about it the last month i'm sure he's been thinking about it the last 10 years, you know? So um, I, I would be surprised if he doesn't have a pretty good idea who he wants, but I, I do concur that, that Bob Dice is one of those people that he's very interested in, in, in giving due consideration for this job. 
And the one thing I've always found the CFL has been missing is stability with their franchises, not just with the GMs and coaches, but players too. So fans can identify them. When I grew up in the late seventies and early eighties, I knew who Edmonton is, Warren Moon, Brian Kelly, Marco St. Clair, um, with the Argonauts, Holloway, Greer, Cedric Menner, Don Moan. And it just seems like that's missing in this, in this current CFL. Yeah. I think some of that, you know, honestly follows wins and losses. Like if you were to, you know, look at the Calgary Stampeders of the last seven years, you'd probably be able to say, you know, Bo Levi Mitchell, Kamar Jordan, the Jameer Thurman, you know, uh, Brandon Smith. I mean, like those, you know, the point being when your team wins consistently, there's less turnover, you know, and the bombers like 25 years from now, if the bombers are crappy and they're turning over players that people will say, well, I remember in the 20, early twenties, we, you know, had, Zach Caleros and Stanley Bryan and Jamarcus Hardrick and Adam Big Hill and Winston Rose and Willie Jeff. Like, you know what I mean, right? Like, so that's part of it. Part of what you're saying is just a function of teams that turn, have higher turnover when they, when they lose. The other part of it is, is there is another element to it. And that's the idea that players really started going to one-year contracts because there were no guarantees for the second and third years. And, the league has brought in a means by which teams can now get guarantees on those final years of the contract. And that's to incentivize them to sign longer term deals to slow turnover in the league. And we've seen some examples of that already. Um, yeah, Willie, uh, what's his name? Zach Calaris's deal. You know, he just signed a three year deal for 600,000 a season. I believe he's got a $250,000 guarantee in the third year. Well, that's the incentive there, right? Cause there's no guarantee unless he signs the multi-year deal. Uh, I believe, Taylor Cornelius probably got that as well. It's, like not every player in the league is going to get it. It's going to be the marquee guys, but those are the guys. I mean, you don't want Micah Johnson playing for a different team every year. Like I, I every halfway through the season, I have to remind myself who he plays for because he changes team every year, right? It's just, I, and I like that's probably worked for him economically and you know make a little more money and move teams and stuff. I, I just don't think it's good for the game if your stars are floating around the league, you know, from one week to another. So, you know, I actually take my hat off to the players association and the league for coming up with that. Cause that was a really tough thing to, to, to solve. And I thought that probably on, on, there's probably no issue where the two sides saw the bigger picture and what was good for the game and moved towards it um, cooperatively than on coming up with that, that formula to try to, again, slow turnover in the game. Cause everybody acknowledges you, you, you know, more turnovers generally makes your game harder to sell to the fans. Absolutely. I'm going to put you on the spot with this question. Can the Winnipeg Blue Bombers become the first CFL team since the Edmonton Eskimos or the Elks in 40 years to three Pete as Grey Cup champions? Well, that's an easy question. Yes, they can. Will they is a little tougher, but I mean, there's, there's absolutely very little reason to look at, you know, why they, why they couldn't. Um, I mean, they're playing at home. Uh, you know, even the Grey Cup is on the prairies this year, which is, you know, I don't know if you call Saskatchewan their second home, but they're certainly adjusted to the climate. Uh, you know, they're, they're healthy for the most part. Uh, they, they've been rested, um, you know, and I mean, nearly three calendar years. And I, and I know they didn't play one season, but I mean, there's one team that thumped them, you know, Hamilton, about a month ago. That's it. Like, you know, they haven't really been hammered by anyone in, in over the course of the end of 2020, sorry, 2019, all of 2020 and this year. So yeah, they, they absolutely can. Uh, I, I think Calgary is the team that could, that can give them a fight, you know, um, you know, BC with their, you know, their, their special teams has been an issue this year. Their run defenses have been an issue recently. And, and I just don't know if Nathan Rourke's going to be evolved far enough from his injury to be the guy. I mean, he was, you know, he, he showed flashes of being that guy in last week's game, but I, I don't know that we're going to get the full Nathan Rourke experience um, in that game this weekend. So I, I kind of think Calgary's the team that could, could scare them a little bit. Uh, I think Calgary's defense has played really well the second half of the year. And that's been probably the biggest difference there. Um, you know, they can certainly run the ball. They can throw it. They got a good offensive line. That's the biggest threat. You know, that's what I would, that's what I would say, but, but unquestionably, you know, Winnipeg is a team that, um, I, I put it this way. I can make a much better case for that. They will than that. They won't. Okay. So I, this is my next question. Calgary at BCA. I, I assume you're leaning towards Calgary and East semifinal yeah. B 
between yeah. Hamilton and Montreal. How do you see that going as well? Well, I'm leaning towards Calgary. Just again, I mentioned the Nathan Rourke thing. And again, the run defense with what Kadeem Carey can do running the ball. Uh, and just that I think Calgary's, I think, just playing better football overall the last two months of the season, and, and particularly on defense. Um, and then the other game, I kind of like Hamilton. I like their defense, um, you know, at, at all three levels. Uh, I think, you know, Dane Evans has been a different player since the bye week about six weeks ago. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, one guy, they both have big play potential. Hamilton has it in Tim White. Montreal has it in Eugene Lewis. Uh, we'll see, you know, I, I would give Montreal the advantage in the run game, but we'll see if Wes Hills plays, is able to go for Hamilton and how he looks. Here's the thing I'll throw at you on Hamilton. They're eight and 10 this year, but they finished with a minus 22 turnover ratio. They gave the ball up 52 times this year wow. and were lost in the league in takeaways. So that to me tells me that's a, that, you know, it, it's, turnover is one of those stats that there's a certain randomness to it, right? Not all of it is random, but there is, but tenor generally teams are not horrible at turning the ball over or have a turnover ratio all the time. It tends to go a little bit, right? You get luck. And, and some of it is you control it. Some of it you don't. My point is, I think they're better than an eight and 10 team when you see that turnover ratio, right? Cause if you gave them a flat turnover ratio, what are they? Well over right? 500, well over 500, well over 500. Yeah. So if they can get into a flat turnover ratio game, I like their chances. That's my, that's my take on Hamilton. I'm, I'm personally as an Argo fan, I'm kind of tired of Hamilton and I'm picking Montreal, but I wouldn't be shocked if Hamilton wins uh, Calgary, BC. I'm picking the lions to win, but again, I think Calgary is more than capable of winning there as well. Like you said, Dave. Yeah, it's uh well, again, I think they've, I think they played very well, you know, in the second half of the season. Um, and I just think they got stronger as, as the year goes along. And and I say particularly on defense, I think that's a that's a big one. Yeah. And a last question. If are you okay for two more minutes, just for one more question? I got I got you got four minutes with me. Okay, well, we'll do it less than four minutes. This one I had to ask you, Dave, as being yeah. a lifelong Argonaut fan, what is the long-term viability of the Argonauts in Toronto under Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment ownership? Well, I mean, it's they're they're viable under MLSE ownership as long as MLSE wants to keep paying the bills, right? But I don't think anybody's under the illusion that the Argonauts are making money right now. So that would lead the, to the you know what is the you know the, the the MLSE has to continue to want to invest and pay the bills, and they'll be viable. And if they're not, uh, if they don't want to do that, then you're going to need somebody else to do that. Right. Cause I think even if you had somebody else take over the team, it's not going to be a situation where you'd be profitable by next season. I don't think, um, you know, it's, it's gotta be a long-term play. So look, MLSE can afford to pay Argonaut losses because, you know, they pay basketball players, you know, <laughs> more for half a season than they lose in the Argonauts for a whole year uh, or maybe a quarter of a season even. So, you know, but I don't know that that's a sustainable um, model you know, for any company. And, and I know people say Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment has tons of money. Uh, you know, why do they, um, you know, why would they care? They can just keep paying the bills in Toronto forever. Well, I, I don't think that's either a fair evaluation of it or a reasonable one because everybody gets tired of losing money at some point. So uh, I, I, as somebody who's, you know, I'm a season ticket holder there. I'm, I'm at a lot of the home games. Uh, you know, I, I, I do have concern about, you know, the future of that franchise and, and, you know, hoping that Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment, you know, continues to to invest in it. And I, and I have no reason to believe they're not. I honestly have no intelligence at all telling me, oh, at the end of this year, that's it for MLSE and the Argos, or they're giving it one more year. I, I've not heard anything. That. And I've made my inquiries and talked to people and things like that. So, um, you know, the long-term viability is that they're viable as long as MLSE wants to pay the bills. And beyond that, they got to get into the point where they can be profitable. And then MLSE would certainly be happy, I think, to own them or, certainly make them easier to pass on to another owner. Okay. Well, Dave, I'm going to let you go, but where can my audience uh, quickly find you and follow you on social media? I am primarily on Twitter at TSN okay. Dave Naylor at TSN Dave Naylor is the Twitter address. And are you going to any of the CFL games this weekend? 
I will be at Montreal for the Hamilton game. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll be watching both games. And, and again, I want to say thank you, Dave, uh, for giving me some time to come on here today. And uh, I hopefully I'll run into you at the East final at BMO field on November 13th against most likely Hamilton, but we'll see what happens this weekend. All right. Make sure you say hello. If you see me there. Will do, Dave. Thank you so much for coming on live with CDP Sports Talk. Have a great day, Dave. My pleasure. Take care. Bye. You too. Bye. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed my podcast show, Season 4, Episode 45, with Dave Naylor. And before we wrap things up, guys, I'm just going to finish up a CFL uh, clip uh, from YouTube. Uh, the plays of the week from the CFL Week 21. Stevens looking to take this wide, find some room on the far side of the field, and he'll get it down to the 50. Now he's going to take off inside the 40. Will they catch him? Stevens is going to go all the way to the house. How about that? 85 yards of third and short for Tommy Stevens. How about that? Tommy Stevens got a little giddy up in him. On third and a yard, takes it around the corner, goes 85 for a touchdown, and that was some serious speed. To use a little bit of an Antonio Pipkin package mm -hmm. in the playoffs, he had demonstrated as much as Kelly has an ability to run with the football. They return here from the year goes to start the second half. Cote slaps the legs of Jeremiah Hadel, can't bring him down, dancing the sideline. Touchdown, Argos. A kickoff return to start the second half. Well, speaking of guys demonstrating some running ability, and he gets it. Can't this deep to the right, trying to create. Now he'll throw it to the back of the end zone up high. Will they say the receiver was in? Touchdown, Argos! Juwan Preskison, for now, has his first touchdown of the year as Kelly rolling away for pressure. Dwayne, you just said he just kind of gets it. Well, he also gets the fact that some. <clears throat> Sometimes you got to make it up on the fly. Anyways, guys, that clip was courtesy of the CFL YouTube channel. Those were the CFL Players of the Week. Again, I want to say thank you to my guest, Dave Naylor, uh, for coming on Season 4, Episode 45 of Live the CDP Sports Talk today. Dave is the uh, uh, NFL and CFL insider for TSN as well. You guys can follow Dave Naylor on Twitter at TSN, that's at TSN Dave Niller, and he's one of the best in the business, and I really appreciate him coming on as well. And uh, guys, just to let you guys also know, um, the Argo Bounce live audio, the Argo Bounce live audio show on Twitter Spaces tonight, Tuesday night at seven o'clock, with my co-host Nick Small as we break down the Toronto Argonauts previous game against the Montreal Alouettes from BMO Field this past Saturday and preview their upcoming opponents, um, which will be the Eastern final November 13th, either Hamilton or Montreal, at Chris D. Pome on Twitter. And tonight, Mike Hogan, uh, the communications manager, the Argonauts play-by-play -play announcer, and also a writer for Argonauts.ca, is going to pop on our Argo Bounce live audio show on Twitter spaces and uh, preview the CFL Eastern semifinal between Hamilton, Montreal, and BC in Calgary, and uh, what to expect uh, from the Argonauts in the Eastern finals on November 13th at BMO Field as well. I'm looking forward to speaking to Mike Hogan, and he's also a huge Philadelphia Eagles fan uh, like myself. Go Birds, fly Eagles, fly. Next live with CDP Sports Talk, sponsored by Barry Cullen Chevrolet. Friday, November 4th at 2.30 p.m. with my guest Rod Peterson. He is a former longtime radio voice of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders for 20 seasons, and he's also the host of his own daily podcast show, The Rod Peterson Show. So I hope you guys could tune in to Season 4, Episode 46 of Live with CDP Sports Talk this Friday, 
November 4th at 2.30 with Rod Peterson as we're going to talk Saskatchewan Rough Riders with him, CFL with him, and maybe some NHL as well. And uh, Rod's um, a Saskatchewan, uh, he's a, a Saskatchewan Hall of Fame uh, broadcaster as well. So I'm looking forward to speaking to Rod about his uh, long career in, in broadcasting and doing play-by-play for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders for 20 seasons as well. And uh, let's see, guys, just also I'm going to mention this. Uh, check out argonauts.ca to purchase tickets for the CFL's Eastern Final at BMO Field on Sunday, November 13th at 1 p.m. And I will be at that game along with my nephew as well. I'm looking forward to it. It, it, it very well is going to be either Hamilton or Montreal, obviously. And uh, it's going to be a great game. Regardless who wins this uh, semifinal this weekend, it'll be a very good opponent for the Argonauts. And uh, the winner of the East Final gets to represent the East in the uh, Grey Cup this year, which is in Saskatchewan. As well, my picks are Montreal and BC to win this weekend, but don't be sh- shocked if Calgary and Hamilton win as well. And as I do with all my podcast shows, guys, just to let you know, live with CDP podcast, the uh, audio version is now available on iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Anchor FM, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, Pocket Casts, Radio Public. Spotify, CastBox, and LinkedIn. And again, guys, I've just added two more platforms recently with iHeartRadio and Amazon Music. So please check me out on iHeartRadio and Amazon Music as well. And uh, as always, StreamYard is the official live stream provider of Live with CDP podcast as well. And you can also follow me on TikTok uh, at Live with CDP. That's at Live with CDP on TikTok as well. And that's about it, guys. Again, I want to say thank you to Dave Naylor, uh, TSN Insider for the NFL and CFL, for coming on today, Season 4, Episode 45. And uh, if you guys give me about 15 minutes, I'll have this podcast downloaded to all my audio platforms as well. And speaking of platforms, I want to say thank you to everybody watching this live on my YouTube channel. Please hit subscribe and hit like if you already haven't done so. And thank you to everyone watching this on Facebook Live and on Twitter Live as well. Again, uh, Live with CDP Sports Talk is sponsored by Barry Cullen Chevrolet Dealership, 905 Woodlawn Road West in the Guelph Auto Mall. Check out barrycullen.com for their newest selection of new and pre-owned GM vehicles or give them a call at 519-824-0210 and tell them that CDP, AK Chris Pame, sent you down there as well. And also you guys can pre-order the uh, O-Electric Cadillac Lyric, which is now available for pre-orders, and also the O-Electric Silverado as well. And one of the sales guys I would check down there is Nathan Laud. He's been there for a while. Nathan's a really good guy. And a shout out to the mechanic there as well, Jim Zettel, for uh, servicing my car over the years at Barry Cullen Chevrolet. And again, I want to say thank you to Mark Cullen uh, from Barry Cullen Chevrolet for sponsoring uh, Live with CDP Sports Podcast as well. And I'm always looking for uh, more local businesses in the Gulf area to come aboard uh, Live with CDP Sports Talk. Anybody interested, please uh, contact me on my social media pages or see Pame. 19 at gmail.com that's about it that's a wrap for season four episode 45 of live with cdp sports talk again uh thank you to dave naylor from tsn coming on talking some nfl some cfl and uh looking forward to the uh cfl playoff games this sunday sunday november 6th i believe uh one o'clock you have hamilton and montreal one o'clock from Montreal, and then four thirty, you have the Calgary Stampeders take it on the BC Lions as well. And Thursday night football, guys, it's the seven and zero Eagles take it on the Houston Texans as well. And also, guys, the World Series tonight, twenty twenty two World Series game three tonight in Philadelphia, eight oh three first pitch on Major League Baseball Network and on Fox as well. And hopefully, the rain will hold off in Philadelphia as well. So. All right. I hope everybody has a great day. And again, thank you for watching and listening to Season 4, Episode 45 of Live with CDP Sports Talk, brought to you by Barry Cullen Chevrolet Dealership. 
here in Guelph. Have a great afternoon, guys, and we'll see you Friday at 2.30 with Rod Peterson, uh, the longtime uh, play-by-play voice of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and the host of his uh, weekly podcast show, The Rod Peterson Show. Have a great day, everybody, and we'll see you Friday at 2.30, or we'll see you tonight on Twitter Spaces, 7 o'clock with my co-host Nick Small and our guest Mike Hogan talking some Toronto Argonauts football on the Twitter spaces and also uh, previewing the CFL playoffs as well. Have a great day, everybody, and thanks again for watching and listening to Live with CDP Sports Talk.